Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Entrepreneurship Matters. This is a conversation we've been having for 45 weeks. Uh, thanks to the urging of an amazing young person. I know she's watching. I already see her in the chat. Uh, Camry Moses, who's an entrepreneur herself, who said it would be inspiring to hear the stories of entrepreneurs from their own mouths. And it has been an amazing journey thus far. And today is no different. I claim that this is a true masterpiece, this today's session. Uh, we know that all entrepreneurs and businesses, it takes undiluted passion, multiple failures, a long-term commitment to make it happen. And the two entrepreneurs, the two artists that we're going to meet today are no different. Let me introduce you to Larry Poncho Brown. Now I'm going to call him Poncho after this. And Ashley Wilder, I'm going to invite them onto the screen. And I'm going to read their bios because they both are such accomplished artists that I have to um, I have to give them justice. Let me give you first Ashley Wilder. Ashley has been honing her skills in oil and acrylic painting for the past several years. Originally, she was a student of history. She has blended her affinity of the subjects, typically the African diaspora and the Black cultural experiences within her artwork. And you're going to see a little bit of those pieces today. Her style is modern with a nod to post-impressionism. Since 2013, she continues to incorporate her church upbringing and historical references throughout her work. For instance, the Tigon series featured women adorned with head wraps and the style of enslaved and Creole women in antebellum Louisiana. In a climate where Black history remains under threat of erasure, she continues to bring history old and new into her work. Um, she is an acclaimed artist. She has been featured on Lead Bal uh, Led Baltimore and premiered at the Noir, Noir de Court uh, Sol solo ex exhibition at the Ubley Blake Center in February of 2017. And during the coronavirus pandemic, she has used her time wisely and she has earned several new collectors with her Blue Anthology series and a number of other works. Welcome, Ashley. So glad to have you here today. And next, um, I will introduce to other, present to others, but and present to some. Larry Poncho Brown, I've realized, Larry, I have some of your pieces. I realized my hairdresser has a number of your pieces in her uh, shop. I know she, she's probably watching, so um, the one where you have the women um, sitting under the hairdryer, so great pieces. He is a uh, native of Baltimore. He started his business at the age of 17 as a sign writer, and he has been a full-time artist ever since. He received his Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in graphic design and photography from the Maryland Institute College of Art. His art, both fine and commercial, has been published nationally and upscale, Ebony, Ebony Man, Essence, and Jet Magazine. His art is featured in the UCLA Fowler Museum of Cultural History book entitled Wrapped in Pride and Connecting with Art. His popular works have been prominently featured on television shows such as A Different World. Everybody remembers that show, Dwayne and Whitley. In the <laughs> House, The Wire, The Carmichael Show, Star, and Greenleaf. Greenleaf, amazing. And yeah, that's the Oprah connection. We know she's watching. <laughs> Movie featuring his work include Avalon, He Said, She Said, and Soul Food. His work adorns the walls of the likes of Camille Cosby, Dick Gregory, Anita Baker, Susan Taylor, Ed Gordon, and Bernard Barner. His original works are in several museums and collections, Coppin State University, the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, the District of Columbia Superior Courts, the Children's Hospital of Richmond at Virginia, and the um, at Virginia Commonwealth University, Howard University Hospital, Yale New Haven Health Park Avenue Medical Center, and soon to be Alicia Wilson's home. Um, he evolved from a graffiti artist in his earlier years to a classically trained sign painter and graphic artist. His works are beautiful. I could go on and on. Let me talk about his philanthropic pursuits because I want to go on that as well and, and have that as a part of our discussion. In pursuing his philanthropic goals, he founded Raising the Arts, which has created over 70 images 
to assist nonprofit organizations and African American organizations with fundraising for the past two decades. He also co founded the Creative Quarantine, which is a collaboration with other professional artists that dedicate the entire month of January to creating new experimental works. Uh, his quote, and I, I want to make sure I say this. He says, my creations are a reflection of my personal values and pay homage to ongoing themes of unity, family, and spirituality. It is an honor to have both of you here today. Um, this is going to be a work of art. Don't worry, I'm going to make enough art jokes to, to last us all day. But let, let, let's jump right in. And I want to talk, and this is going to be a special conversation, because we talk about inspiration and every entrepreneurship matter. But you two um, are special in the sense that your entrepreneurship is different than almost anyone else we featured. So can you talk about what inspired you to choose to occupy your life with making pieces that bring joy and, 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 and happiness to so many? So Ashley, why don't I start with you and then I'll go to Poncho. I will say... I'm probably most inspired by what I've seen growing up. And that's, that's my people. I've always seen black people from the church to the home, to the schools. And so that is something if you, I'm probably going to quote this incorrectly, but bear with me. Um, it's Frida Kahlo. And it's, I paint what I, I paint myself because that is what I know best. I paint black mm -hmm. people because that is what I know best. Uh, and if you look throughout my catalog, you'll really see that I, I choose more to focus on women and children. And more, more often than not, I've realized that the Black woman is often forgotten. And I feel like as an artist, it's my responsibility to not only show her, but show her authentically and show her in a positive light. And yeah. so throughout my work, I refuse to um, not be genuine in the way that I'm representing not only Black women, but also myself. So that, that really is um, what drives me. I want to make sure that no one else can tell our story, whether it be written or visual. I want to have a hand in that. And mm -hmm. if I am breathing, that is what I intend to do. I just want to allow that to be the mark that I leave on the world. So beautifully stated. I mean, you can tell you're an artist. You just are poetic in, <laughs> in, in, your, in even your speech of, of relating that. Such a beautiful, I paint what I know best. I mean, it's beautiful, beautiful imagery. How about you, Poncho? What, what inspired you? 17 years old, you, you have been painting and producing since that, probably earlier, but what, what um, else? Um, we have an elementary school on today. Great. Um, Moravia Park is watching. So the hats off to both of you. Um, I want to give them a shout out as they're watching. But Pancho, what, what inspired you to want to go to become an artist? Uh, I am the, I'm a second generation artist of a teenage parent. Mm. gave up his dream of art, of being an artist, to raise his family. Wow. And so I came up at a time where I always had art in the home. I always had things hanging on the wall. But when I went outside to my friends' houses, they had Martin Luther King. They had Jesus Christ with the ray of light. They had Jesus Christ kneeling. They had the Last Supper. They may have had JFK and Martin Luther King together, but that was the extent of what they had on the wall. So I already knew something was wrong early. Mm -hmm. And that I saw it in my own home, but I didn't see it everywhere else. And so that whole thing that Ms. Wilder was making a point on is that um, as I was getting more into art and realized they were not very, there were very few depictions of us. And so I had this desire to color everything. I would mm -hmm. get a, 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 I would get a card to give to somebody else and I would paint, I would, instead of the white one, I would paint brown on them before I sent it to the, in the mail. I was always conscious of that fact. From a very young age because my dad um, was a self-taught artist and he was doing his stuff at home. Mm. Would you say your father's style is sort of like yours or very two different styles? Uh, I think that to to have a conversation without realizing that all of this is DNA based would yeah. be foolish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, artists are striving to be ind individuals and independent and being original, but at some point you have to realize that this is all DNA coded in us to utilize. And so, uh -huh. no, I never denied it. There's parts of me that was in uh, uh, my father's work is in my work. My work is in my son's work and the other way around, you know. So, uh, and then uh -huh. I've even inspired my dad in a different way because I went to professional track 
and he went completely a different uh, direction into printing. And so mm. after a 28 year lapse of not doing art, he ventured back into the art and I became his, his, his mentor. Wow. And stage kind of a role reversal relationship. So no, the DNA part is important. And I think that applies not just to me, it applies to everybody that has a creative um, spirit. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. let, let me get to a couple of um, questions that are not on, not ones that I prepped you on, but are coming into the chat. And let me invite people to be a part of this conversation. Folks seem to already be willing to do so. So you can put them in the chat. Those who are listening on the phone, you may text them to 22333, type J-H-U-W-L in the message, and then type your question in. And those who are on Facebook, I see you already commenting in the chat. Feel free to keep doing so. And I will take all those questions and make sure they become a part of this conversation. What, what is your artistic inspiration? You talked about, you know, I'll go back to you, Ashley. You talked about uh, women and children being, being the images that are in it. But the question that's been posed is what, what has been, um, what's been your inspiration for what, what, what keeps you creating art? Because you could make one and be done, right? But what keeps you creating art? Sure. Art feeds my soul. So though I'm an artist, I also have another uh, job. And in my career, I feel like it's, it's so heavy, right? The responsibility of the world are really yours when you're working. And as an artist, I have to take a step back and kind of like self-soothe mm -hmm. and get my emotions out. And yeah. so my emotions come out in the paintings. Like if you look at some of them, the eyes are so expressive. And I remember I did a few of them. One was um, Amends. And that was from the Blue Apology series. And his eyes were so sad. And that was also at the height of what was happening with um, George Floyd and everyone else that was happening. It was, it was such an emotional piece. And I feel like I'm a very private person, but my art allows me to get out those emotions and really show what's happening here. Um, that, that honestly inspires me and just a matter of just being authentic. I feel like a lot of times you have people who are interested in the arts for the sake of calling themselves an artist. Yeah. But for me, it's like, I want to make sure that whatever it is that I'm creating is a true representation of me and all of my facets. And so that is what really drives home for me, being my truest form of myself, whether it be upset, angry, sad, emotional, depressed, you're getting all of that. Because I feel mm -hmm. like all too often we're, we're told to shy away from things that aren't pleasantly appealing. Yeah. But that's what makes you you. So we're responsible for showing that as well. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. Again, Pancho, what, what would you say? What, what inspires you? I see along, Pancho said we can't take a tour, so we can't see all the paintings. <laughs> we've, shown them, we've shown them in the preview. You see them on the website. We'll tell you how to see them on the website. But what keeps you making, making art? <laughs> what keeps you going? Um, oh, you why would I get the tour? I, I, what I can say is that in, in my career, uh, my, my 40th year career as being a full-time artist, the one thing that I never heard people say together was two things, artist and business and mm. artist and spirit. Mm. And they are, we're, we've been miseducated about what all of that stuff means. And so mm -hmm. being able to decode that over the years and understand uh, that, that we as image makers have a responsibility, um, but it doesn't have to be as specific as we think. You know, right now, uh, what's so wonderful is that we're seeing so many different expressions of spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, like Ms. Wilder said, she does women and because the women wasn't represented, but where I come from, the women is the central figure of all of the artists that I know. Women mm -hmm. and children are the central figures that show up in this work. And so I'm pushing to do more things that show young men because young, mm. men are not mm. depicted. young men are not depicted in work. And when people go to start shopping for their homes, if you look at the 10 paintings that they purchased, nine times out of 10, you won't see a young black male in it. Huh, so interesting. I'm trying to think of the art I have, um, and the one behind me, you know, Jonathan Green, uh, you know, a lot of women pictures. Well, I mean, women levitate to images of beautiful women and, and they should. I, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with what- No, 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 I'm that. just thinking of like- yeah. what, But what, what happens you... is that you do uh, an, uh, an extension of who you are. And if you're a multifaceted uh -huh. person, then that multifaceted issue 
shows up in your work. For yeah. me, I'm trying to show all the things that people don't get to see about Black people. You know, mm-hmm. I first started in the business, it was stereotypical stuff of us in the South, Jim Crow South, going to a, a white church, you know, and now it's so different. We're in so many different uh, aspects of life now and being able to present those things leaves us an open palette to, to show the world. And I think that's what's important about art. It's like, it's not one thing and it shouldn't be one thing. Um, yeah. okay. Art is inspired by different things. Um, I, I came through a period of time where, where there was the largest art explosion since the Harlem Renaissance. You know, mm-hmm. it's called the Golden Age of African American Art because it was from 1985 to 2005, around the time when Good Times and the Bill Cosby Show came out. There was this huge cultural explosion in the arts that yeah. became a really national, almost international explosion. And we hadn't seen that kind of, of attention since the Harlem Renaissance. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, for me, I know what was happening during that period of time, what artists were doing and the, the, and what they, the stage they set for people to view African-American people in a very different way. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you talk about the influences. I know we were talking about a different world, but you know, the Cosby Show, uh, Good Times, all those shows that really brought to the fore some artists that you'd never seen before. So, I mean, amazing advice. Now you talk, you just talked about Art and business not being usually said in the same 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 sentence, um, and I'm going to get right to that because you do have businesses, people, um, you do make money, and we want you to make more money um, because you of what you do, and that's one of the reasons why we're on here for folks to support both of these artists, um, but not just support. This is not even this is just buy, just buy, 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 buy good product. Hi, good product. And we're introducing you to two, two individuals that are making great pieces. Can you talk about how you went from the first paintbrush, the first pen, first whatever you picked up to starting a business? Uh, I know we have a number of people on here who are artists and who are saying, how did they transition from just making things, making something into a business where um, they could get paid for it. So I'll start with you, Ashley, and then go to Poncho. Sure. Um, I do want to say one thing, Poncho. You said something, and I don't think I, I don't think I correlated it to anything until you just mentioned it. The piece about the black boy. Mm-hmm. My work of black boys, they have sold the fastest, and I don't think I ever correlated that until you just mentioned it. Um, but to answer your question, Alicia, I was nervous. I was so afraid. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, what does this actually mean? Because, you know, I've been, I've always heard like, oh, you know, artists, they don't make money. You're not, you're not successful or you're not known until, you know, you're dead and gone. And so I was like, well, I, I fail to believe that that's true, right? You know, you may not know many or, you, or I may not be exposed to them, but that can't just be it. Yeah. And so it, it took for me to, um, I started posting my pieces on Instagram and I was just, just painting. I've been painting since I was, my grandfather was if you gave me a pencil, I'd be quiet. So like, that's where it really started. Wow. But as far as like truly selling my pieces, it started maybe in 2011, I want to say. Um, but it wasn't until very recently I said, I'm going to make this a business. It's something that I've been able to make money off of. And I want to be able to say, I own this. So for me, entrepreneurship really meant ownership and saying that this is mine, no one can take it away from me. And it's something that I've built for myself. And so it allowed me to not only be creative, but also in a way be self-sufficient. So that was really what made me just say, I'm just gonna take that leap of faith. You, I would much rather say that I tried and I failed than to just be like, well, I should probably have done this. Like, what was the hesitation? So I just, I, I prayed and took the leap of faith. And I've been, I've been flying for a little bit now, so I'm happy about it. And so you go, you fly, you take a, you choose ownership and, and what, how do you sell? Like when, what did you do to start selling? Did you go to shows or did you go on the web? How did you start? I sold a couple of pieces to some friends and some colleagues. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, well, this is probably, I can, I can package this better. I think it would have more of an impact if I, really made sure that I was business-minded. And so I did my research. I 
got an LLC. I started a website. Well, I created the website. I focused on branding. I got myself involved in a couple of, um, uh, what is it called? They're like think tanks. I'm, I'm, it's, I'm, it's, it's escaping me, but I did um, BCAN. So to like really yep. learn like the taxes behind it, how do I um, advertise myself? Like, what is my elevator pitch? I studied, mm -hmm. I really wanted to study and make sure that not only was I doing this and I was, I, I didn't want to half step it. I wanted to make sure that I was going about it the right way. And I wanted yep. to just utilize every, worse, every resource that I had available to me. So yep. that if anyone's listening and you're interested in, in being an entrepreneur as an artist, do your research, you know, make sure that you are um, thinking things through, not only just for yourself, but for your business. What is your, what, what are your goals um, that you're setting for yourself as far as your business? That's really what I had to decide. And mm -hmm. me creating that I'm always gonna create, but how can I say, how can I own this? How can I make sure that's remembered? Yeah, I, mean, I picked up seven points you made. So maybe you didn't, maybe you didn't mean to make seven points, but I, first you dismissed the reasons to doubt, like, uh, you know, at the outset. Second, you chose ownership, beautiful language and self-sufficiency. Third, you sold pieces to your family and friends. Family and friends come up in every entrepreneurship matters. Whoever your friends are, <laughs> they're like, they're buying the first pieces. Third, fourth, you did your research. You did website, branding, social media. You went to BCAN, so you got a technical assistance provider to help you. You studied, I can't remember how many times you said study, but you said it more than four times, so that was emphasis. And then you set goals. Excellent points. Folks taking notes, those are excellent points for them. Pancho, how, how did you go about it? Um, I was born in inner city Baltimore. So east or west, east or west. I, I, I've been on both sides. I can tell you a whole lot about Baltimore City. Okay, all right. What you? Well, what I will tell you is that I was fearless because art is a commodity. Mm -hmm. It took me a while early because I went to a vocational school. Let me start with that. Shout out to vo our Carver Vocational Technical High School. I came through a Virgo, period of time. I came through Baltimore at a time when African Americans usually attended Carver or, or Mergenthal or other vocational education schools to learn a trade. Mm -hmm. And I went to study commercial art. That's how I became a sign writer. And um, in that program, you would um, learn hand lettering or sign writing for three years. It's a very intensive program. You learn uh, perspective design, uh, all kinds of other um, basis for creating design. Uh, and then on the third year, you would get work study. And I went in and I learned it in three months. So they had to try to figure out whether to put me on work study at the age of 14. I was the first 10th grader they ever looked at and said, well, is this kid ready for work study? Now, <laughs> mature wise, I wasn't, <laughs> but talent wise, I was. So I was often chasing my talent. Okay. Mm -hmm. But what I learned from Carver was that these people learn how to hustle their ability. If you yeah. were a bricklayer, if you were a cosmetologist, you, you didn't sit around waiting for somebody to validate you. You actually had a pool of people that you could use your trade on. And I was no different. Art for me was the same way. I would walk mm -hmm. by a Chinese food store and say, yo, man, I can't read your sign. I got a guy that can fix it. If he, you know, And he'll say, send the guy back tomorrow and I'll come back with my paintbrush. And so I had that get in your face and sell what I have, that was given to me very early. And I consider that a blessing because most artists don't have that. They're in their head about this thing, trying to demystify what it was given to them for. Mm -hmm. and, and you, until you get a vantage point, um, I can break it down for you. God only gave artists and, and creatives this ability for therapy <laughs> to sit down, to absorb and look at the world different, feel the world different, have a different language and to calm us down. So for every three paintings I do, that was one person I probably would have killed in Baltimore. <laughs> so I get, hey. my I get my therapy. And so yeah. what happens to me now is I'm trying to teach artists how to start at the beginning of what it means long before you start talking about the business side of it. And so here I was at 14, learning that I had an ability to sell that while my friends were selling drugs, I was painting signs. Mm. And, and as I went through my progression, every other skill set I learned 
I learned how to monetize that. This is pre before internet. This is before mm-hmm. social networking was available. You had to be able to converse with people and build a following. And so the key for me was learning early that I could build a following of people that would support me. Mm-hmm. Have I talked about pictures yet or paintings or inspiration? No, because at that point I was just trying to figure out well, what was I trying to say? What did I want to say? Mm-hmm. And then match that to the people. And mm-hmm. I learned how to do that very early, you know? Um, so I'm not bogged down into getting into some real heavy head theory of what my work means and what it's, how it places in the world. I get out of the way. All I'm trying to do in this life is to use the gift that the creator gave me. I'm getting out of the way. I get my therapy. But the thing that I'd have that's different than most artists is that most artists are right brain dominated. I'm not, I use both. And I'm teaching other artists how to use both parts of the brain because they want to get heavy into the creativity and the originality and the spiritual part of it. But before you can ever eat from that or feed your family from that, you have to understand that this is a business and how do I structure it so that I can raise my kids? I, how, so I can put some kids through college so I can buy my home, so I can buy my car and not be ashamed of it because often we're ashamed of trying to shoot for um, fortifying ourselves with our mm-hmm. talent. That's a whole different brainwash. You know, I didn't have parents that said, you're going to starve, you can't do art. But I know hundreds and thousands of artists that went through that experience. Yeah. You know, so my thing is that art is a bigger word than we, than those three letters. There's so many different facets of art that each one of us can participate in. It's part of everyday life. So beautiful. I mean, I wrote down seven. So both of you had seven points that you made and I'm going to put them back to you. First of all, you talked about you were fearless because you understood art to be a commodity. Second, you talked about you studying commercial art at Carver and I, I went to Merville. I didn't study commercial. I can't, I, I can't, but the Votech, I, I understand that you, you, that hustle and what that brings to you and how much it helps to fuel you. People will never understand mm-hmm. that um, unless you go through it. You then third, um, you really were chasing your, your, um, your talent was chasing your, say it again. I was chasing my talent. You were chasing your talent. I can't even read my handwriting so bad. Um, Fourth, you talked about you learn how to hustle your ability. Such a, I mean, that's a quote. That's a quote that will give a whole speech. Fifth, you learn how to monetize your your talent. Sixth, you built um, a following of people. And seventh, um, you figure out how to use your gift to be a business. Uh, excellent points for everyone out there um, watching and, and listening. Let me get to a couple of questions that folks are asking, which I think build off of what we we just talked about. You both talked about you you dispelled doubt or doubt never came in in the beginning, thankfully. Um, what was the advice you received early on that you think was critical to your success? What was something, a word someone said to you, you thought, Yep, this this actually, I've carried this with me. Ashley, why don't I start with you and then Poncho? So I guess it's like, I have to refer back to something Poncho said. I, I'm a very logical person. Um, I've been told that I'm a very different type of artist and I take that as a compliment, not necessarily an insult because um, it, it, it allows me to navigate, right? The one thing that I would say has helped me is I have a best friend who has been telling me for years, you are selling yourself short. Like just sell it, start the business, do it. And it was one of those things where I think it's it's okay for people to see where you should go before you should or before you can. Um, I'm definitely receptive to that. And I, I think had I not had that playing in the back of my head, I would have been like, eh, I'll just keep coasting but I knew that there was something there. It was just that I had to allow for my confidence to also get to that point. And so for me, Gretchen is definitely gonna hate me, but Gretchen is the reason why I was like, okay, 
I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see what I can do here. It was, it was my best friend in my head saying like, believing yourself a little bit more. Like you're, you're smart, but like you are far more talented than you know. Oh, wow. It's really important. I always say the company you keep is really important when you're talking about absolutely. the it's trajectory. Absolutely. What would you say, Pancho? What, I know you're well, about to say. Again, I, my energy was different because I came from a, 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 a kind of a unstable kind of a, a foundation. But I was, I was uh, my teacher, when I walked into my commercial art class, said to me, um, son, you are the descendant of kings. Mm. And I went, oh, God, this man's crazy already. I ain't even gotten the building good yet. <laughs> the second thing he said to me was that white people will never let you do the kind of art you want to do. So let me show you how to paint signs and you'll always eat. Mm. And for so long, that statement stuck with me that I was like, you know what? I'm going to prove these folks wrong. That's, that can't, my life can't be that now. And in the beginning, I almost succumbed to that way of thinking. I went to the Maryland Institute, which is a long white institution. And I went with that statement, like branded in my brain. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you that if you reach a point where you realize that the only things limiting you is yourself. Yeah, You can't listen to the white noise. I call it white noise because I love anything black. Okay, but that's what it becomes. It's like you start listening to an artist. It's just, it's not just a poncho story. Yeah, Artists have this ability and they don't know what to do with it. And everybody else sees the ability and they have an opinion about it. Yeah. You got some that's going to see some things in you that you don't see in yourself. You have one pivotal person who's going to see you and want to push you forward. My guy was Eric Toombs who used to let me come in his house and he would make me draw with him. My father wasn't letting me draw with him, but, but he was. And when I tell him that he was my inspiration for starting in business, he shies away from it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you got people who want to take a piece of you because yeah. they see your talent. And so we have to figure all of this stuff out, you know? And so I've lived my whole life trying to demystify this stuff to artists because it's really not that complicated. You got an ability and God didn't intend for you to do it for yourself. Mm -hmm. That's the first big wake up call I give artists. It's like a creative circle. And when you're painting for yourself in a vacuum, you're only using half the circle. When you start servicing other people, selling to other people, sharing your work with the world, this circle, this creative circle will keep you inspired for the rest of your life. Because within that circle are so many opportunities where you can overlay your talent. Have I talked about paintings yet? No. Yeah. Mm -mm. It's not about paintings. That's why I say, now, don't get me wrong. I pride myself on my abilities and, and my responsibility as an artist, okay? But I, that's why I said I realized it was a commodity and I had to figure out, well, what folks go spend money on what they want to spend it on. How are you yeah. going to tell me they're not going to buy one of my pictures? Mm -hmm. My work is in 500,000 homes because of that movement I described earlier, where we begin to make artwork accessible to the masses during a time when they were craving culture. It, and I had no roadmap. There were no mentors in Baltimore that could drive me in that direction. I believe in God because he took me through a path that showed me how I could possibly connect to these people, you know? And so we weren't buying art. Art wasn't one of the things Black folks was buying in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, but in the 80s and 90s, it changed, mm -hmm. okay? My, I'm a baby boomer. My parents were born in 1945, they're baby boomers. My whole family, can you imagine a whole family of baby boomers because they were teenage parents? So I came at a different time. I yeah. have become an OG <laughs> in that I know how the art business was and I know how it is today. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's just vast misinformation. Mm -hmm. you know, most of those people that tell you, hey, you can't do it, or hey, people start, all those things, these people, I learned right away, and I learned part this by the time I was 18 years old. The naysayers never show up in your bank account. Hold no, on. they don't. Whoa. Hold on. Can somebody quote that? Jackie, can you the quote? I need, to, I need that. The naysayers never I, show I up in later. your bank account. And what happens is artists are very sensitive beings. So while they're saying they're not listening to this rhetoric, 
They're listening to all of this coming through at one time while just trying to maintain their creativity and trying to find their own personal identity. And a lot of artists have succumbed to that same stuff. You know, I know artists that look at me like I'm Wonder Dog. I'm not Wonder Dog. I'm just one of the ones that got out the way and listened to what the creator was telling me and looking at the opportunities. Mm-hmm. And, I, I, and then that, that thing that my teacher said to me, he was wrong. And I proved him wrong. Yeah. And I'm trying to demystify that for other artists so they can know that this playing field is so wide open. Yeah. If all these other races can do art, then why can't Black people do it? We have a sensitized market. They copy everything we do. We have our own style. We have our own language. It's been copied and duplicated. Everybody want to be Black, but nobody wants to be Black. So my job is easy. It's easy and I love it. I'm, I'm inspired every day by the good and bad things that I see. And I would never run out of things to paint. Mm. Such beautiful, I mean, you preached the whole word there. Ashley, we both, we, uh, both, we both got a sermon. I mean, beautiful. And I know the young people that are watching, we have so many young people watching today. Uh, we truly inspired by both of you and I, I want to I want to shift us into a question, which I see some folks have put put in, which are um, how can they start collecting? They want to it, art is a business. They want to start collecting. What's your advice for them? If they cut, they came on here today and they got inspired and they say, you know what? You're right. I want to start collecting art. I want to start having that in my home. You talk about this renaissance. Ashley, what would you say? How, how, do you, how should folks start thinking about collecting art? I always tell people, you, you go to the one that pulls you. Mm-hmm. I think art is supposed to like make you feel something. So for me, when I talk to collectors and they're like, okay, well, I really like this piece, but I'm drawn to this one. I automatically say, well, that's the one for you. Mm-hmm. It, it really just starts with just saying, I'm going to buy this piece. Um, just yesterday, I had people asking questions around like, okay, for your print, what's the series number? And I'm like, yes, people are actually becoming more educated on like what they're purchasing. Just buy what makes you feel good. Buy okay, for buy. everybody that's watching, they just asked what the series number, what, what, what did you, what did they just ask and what was your response? So, so I had released a series called Between the Lines and mm-hmm. I chose to do prints of only three of them. But I also recognize that like, I don't want this piece to be overly saturated, I would say, as far as like, I I stopped at seven. So if Mm -hmm. you're going to buy a print for me, it's going to stop at number seven. One, I like that number. Two, I know that the lower the number, the greater the value, because I know for a fact that when I'm dead and gone, my intention is to make sure that the work outlives me. And Mm -hmm. also that the children in my village have one, not only an original, but they have something, a piece within a series, preferably one or two, that sits with them. So I always say, if you're gonna buy a piece of artwork, try to get the lowest number. One, that is where the value is. Two, buy what makes you feel good. Three, I think art is supposed to cover up your walls. Like it's your home, your home to be a reflection of you inside and out. And I think to uh, what was mentioned earlier, that is what art is for. Excellent, excellent. Pacho, what, what would you say? Someone, child's on here, five years old. Moravia Park, y'all are seven, six, seven. How, how what, what, are you, what advice are you giving to them? But also, what are you giving to people who are just a couple years older than seven, like me? What do you tell us about collecting? <laughs> I think the most important thing to recognize is that art is used to document our history and to uh, share a story of the time. Mm-hmm. artists have a responsibility in the job okay so before you can start talking about collecting you got to talk about whether well, it's an important part of your culture mm-hmm. you know so a lot of us will go by go to macy's or go on amazon and empty the place out they got boxes coming every day but art might not be one of the things that's on your list yeah. and all i'm challenging people to do is i'm asking the question why why wouldn't it be okay mm-hmm. And so once you get people, once a person buys their first piece, and it doesn't matter to me whether it's a limited edition of seven, whether it's a limited edition of 1500, to me, 
once you get them indoctrinated into capturing that piece of culture and knowing that it's being passed down to your children and enlightening your children and family and your community, then you're already doing it. Now you're gonna get seasoned as you go along because you buy what you like in the beginning and, you, and hopefully you're buying what you can afford because <laughs> people don't need art. It's not bread, butter or gas and electric, okay? But once you get indoctrinated and you've accepted it as part of your culture, that's when things really start to happen. That's when you begin to see things different. Then once you start seeing things different, you might not have ever been, been interested in going to a museum. Then all of a sudden, a museum might become appealing to you. When we did this movement between 1985 and 2005, it was the, the biggest art appreciation course ever. We had literally millions of people who were saying, oh my God, this art thing I need it is part of who I am, okay? Mm -hmm. What also happened during that period of time, because that was a 20 year period, is that right after that, they start taking art out of schools, music out of school, dance out of schools. So now we had a whole generation coming right behind that. They had no connection whatsoever. And now it's 30 years. So now I'm experiencing that void that happened when they took art out of schools. So people are being re-educated all over again now. That's the job we had, is to make sure that people accept it as part of their development, part of their culture, and then we can have a dialogue about collecting and then the other part of it, because it's really, a, it's, it's a journey. It's not mm -hmm. one part, and you don't come in in the middle, and you can not come in at the end. You got to come in with something that moves you first. I don't care if it's a $5 print, if it moves you and inspires you to do something else. And then the research part of it starts to come when you start going to galleries, you start meeting other artists, you know, they, they, every artist is going to drop a nugget on you every time you talk to one, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's how it gets started. I've, I've seen people who started with one piece now, they have made the collections now, you know? Yeah. But I tell everybody, just like you go and buy all the other crap that's in your house, which depreciates as soon as it comes to your door, art is one of the things that don't. And the one thing black folks get after a while, it's like, okay, so this has a value? Oh, okay. How, show me how that works. Then that's when the dialogue starts to happen. That's when they start looking for other pieces. I have pieces, people who bought pieces for their wall that were posters or prints who are now buying original works. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to pigeonhole it into one or the other or what kind of medium you're doing. And, but I will say that the culture piece is at the core of all of it. Mm -hmm. Both of you have beautiful pieces. Poncho, you going to let us see. Poncho's not getting up. Okay, but as she has some, <laughs> she has some pieces behind her, and you would say those are finished, right? Would you say those are finished? When this question came, when do you know a piece is finished? You don't know where to put your brush. That's for me. So you don't me, know where to put your brush. Yeah, it's one of those things where so I paint to jazz, so I let the music just go, and I stop when I stop. Um, whether that be if a painting takes me months or a painting that could just literally just be a one sitting painting. I know when to stop when I feel like it's not even a feeling of exhaustion. It's just like, I, I feel good about it. Like when I, yeah, you, you step back and you just sit there and you're just like, I, I have nowhere else to put any paint. That is how I know. And I sit with that for a little bit just to make sure like I'm really certain about this. And then the next thing I'm like, all right, it's ready for a signature. That's how I you know, navigate it. I'm also an emotional painter. So I'm never just painting one piece at one time. And so oh. I, I think it's really when, when I get over that emotion or I work through that emotion and, and taking care of myself, that's when I know it's time for that piece to just be finished. Pancho, do you have the same similar? Do you, uh, when do you know that it's finished? I'm, I'm, I'm very close to Ms. Wilder, but mine is, is another, it's a little different. Um, I realized that art is a series of corrected mistakes. As it's like we sit there, it starts off blank and we make it into this illusion to make you think it's something there. And then we hone it and, and, and peck on it to, to continue that illusion. Then you're able to either get the illusion or not get the illusion. We're trying to make you get the illusion. And then you reach a point where it's like, huh, I can't do anything else. Because mm -hmm. everybody, every artist have gone too far and messed up a piece, okay? Uh, at this point, I don't, I don't, I just kind of know when it's done. It's, it's, it's innate. I, I keep saying, 
art and spirit go hand in hand. You got to trust your spirit to know when it's done, when it's complete, when you've said enough. I think that's the thing is that, have you said enough on this particular piece? Mm. You know, so um, I think that's how you define finish. Because I'm, I'm like her. I have ADD. I have 10, 15 pieces going it was just me. at the same time. It's like I, I, because what happens is I have a short attention span. Y'all could probably tell that, right, by the way I talk, right? So I'm working on this and I'll get, okay, I don't want to burn it off. I don't want to burn up on it. So let me walk away. I'll do this over here. And before you know it, I, being a prolific artist is another conversation. See, there's two types of artists. Let me tell you who they are. They're the ones that take pride. Okay, in break it down. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We want everybody to sit up, sit up, everybody. That's right. So, poncho, Poncho, is, let me tell you so something. Important. This is so I've important. Been, I didn't realize Again, logic, right? So when I thought about prolific, I'm like, what are you trying to say? And then an art collector told me that I was prolific and I was like, I still don't get it. And then someone came into my house and he saw my studio and then it came out. Now I'm done. Okay. Okay. Now prolific means something to different people. Mm -hmm. so you gotta remember when that movement came out in 85, you're talking about the very best of the very best that was in that movie. You're talking about maybe 150 artists that was at the top of the game. You had to kind of compete against these people. Mm -hmm. And so you break off and you go to their studios and sometimes your mouth just fall open because you can't believe how much work these people are doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you got artists that are introspective that are in their heads and they're doing more creativity in their head, but it's not coming out in their portfolio. Yeah. And you've got artists that are prolific in that it's flowing like water. I mean, it's just flowing like water. And then when you walk into their studios like this place here and you'll be falling over stuff and you'll be wondering, when does this person sleep? What, what, is, what is happening here? And you just can't can make the connect. The connect is that's what pro, prolific is. Prolific <laughs> is people where they let it flow and they're not being as introspective. And there are people who are in this perpetual stage of thought and rethought and rechanneling and reprogramming. And I find that artists of today, because they have so many distractions, the phone, the this, the that, the do, the that, that it, they are creating in their heads and not on their canvases. Mm -hmm. And so I will outpaint most artists because I get that piece and I let it flow. I don't try mm -hmm. to overdefine it. I don't try to put a box on it. I don't try to say what it is. I'm just trying to get that word I told you a little earlier, my therapy. I focus on my therapy first. If I can attach my spirit to my therapy, to my production, then I can talk about business because I'm going to be ready. Because if you don't have those things in place, you're going to be arbitrarily making it through. And I never want to arbitrarily make it through anything. I look at each one of my paintings like a bullet because I'm from Baltimore. And I ain't going to run out of bullets. Yeah. N let, me, let me ask you this. So, so both of you are prolific. Do you, we got this question in the chat. Do you ever experience creative blocks? So, or is it, is it all, do you ever, or you, do you work through that creative block? I think when you get out the way, you don't get a creative block. For instance, mm -hmm. in January, I did a creative quarantine with 12 other artists from different parts of the country. It was created for us to have a space to create for a month. I created 71 pieces in 31 days. Mm -hmm. Some artists don't get 20 pieces done in a year. Mm -hmm. So the word prolific is being used for talent level, for level of completion, for how your work looks. No, it's different. It's a commodity. The more I have, the more I own, the higher my mm -hmm. value. And so I don't focus on the headspace. I'm focused on making sure that I'm keeping that flow of me and the creator and the spirit moving. And that's my dividends. And then I can sit back after that and make an assessment, okay, I got this I can do over here. I can produce this in prints and go over here. I can do this in products and licensing over here. I can do X, Y, Z with my licensing over here. Multiple streams of income, but focusing on the spiritual part of it first. Well, this is such, uh, I mean, one, both of you, just such a rich conversation, so easy to digest in terms of, you know, 
understanding what your process you're going through. Do you have creative blocks, Ashley? I don't think so. It's it's kind of bad because at times I realize that like I'm not actually engaging with other people because I'm just in my own little space. And before I know it, it's just like, how did I get here? You know, so it, it, it got for me, it got to the point where I was just like, let me just make sure I have enough supply that I can, I don't have to break away from it and say, well, let me go and handle one, two, and three. So to say that I have a, um, a mental block, it's no, I'm actually really surprised. It's only May about the amount and quality of work that I've been able to produce just up until this point this year. So I say whatever's flowing, God can continue to pull up on me because Such a I've been blessed not to experience it. And I think mental blocks come when you don't have anything to say. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, if you always have something to say, you can always see and interpret and, 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 and um, you know, articulate, then you're not going to run out of subjects. I could walk down the street to the corner store and, and see a theme that's going to come up in a painting somewhere because that's how rich our culture is. Uh -huh. you know? uh -huh. So, but um, it all comes down to discipline. Yeah. Let's see, that's a word we talk about. We talk, we'll talk about creativity all day long, the process all day long, but we won't talk about the word discipline. And see, this show is really about entrepreneurship. It's not about being an artist. It's yeah. about what are you doing to make this a viable commodity? And that's why I keep using that word. I don't, I don't want people, I wanted people to understand what I mean by that. Okay. Uh -huh. um, I wanted to understand, number one, when I do my work, I am spiritually connected to each piece that I do, but I also understand what it represents for me. And I told you what that is, my therapy. After that, I have a list. I have spreadsheets full of work. Just, just like putting a dollar in the bank. Okay. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. so that's most important to me right now to say artists get that you have to be business minded. Once you sell a piece, you're a professional artist. Forget, uh -huh. I don't care what, how long you've been doing it. The moment you take a check, you are a professional artist. Now, if you want to do 12 paintings a year, kudos. If you want to do 20 paintings a year, kudos. When I go to portfolio reviews, I'm invited to all of the top art schools in this country. I see a big problem happen. The kids are overthinking and their portfolios are um, computer generated. So they, they think they can hide behind the slickness of a computer. But because I was... I was bred before the computer. I can see through it like it's, I, I can tell them who can draw, who can't draw, who can use color, who can't use text. I can see all of that. But I also can tell that they're not working enough. That whole mm -hmm. thing that, uh, that this is a process, art is a process. You have to be willing to go through the journey. Too many artists yeah. now are seeking fame. Mm -hmm. They're seeking opportunity. But when I ask them how many paintings they did in 2020, they'll tell me 20. And I'll go, that sounds really good. But you're telling me that's two paintings a month. Yeah. Who else do you know can do something two times a month and feel like they're doing something? Because mm -hmm. they get caught up in the process of creating art. I'm like, yeah, but that's not reality. How you can eat two times a month, creating two times a month? Mm -hmm. And so for me, I'm like, you still have to be disciplined enough to go, okay, yeah. I hear you. Your production schedule is your personal time. Mm -hmm. I don't paint every day. I paint four to six months out of the year. Every artist has to track their individual creative cycle. It's a cycle. Now, don't get me wrong. I have people who paint every day and they blow my mind because I wish I could do that. But the times that I'm not being creative in painting those six months, I'm doing administrative stuff. I'm doing my web stuff. I'm creating all kinds of other virtual opportunities. I'm doing other art related stuff that feeds me so that when I get back to my table, that the two things make me very productive in the course of a year. And for me as an artist, if you keep moving, there's so many opportunities right now that it's hard for you to burn out. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Burnouts usually also come from depression. People don't wanna talk about the emotional aspect. Ashley just told you something very, very important that she lives a very isolated life. And that's the way most artists live. Y'all talking about quarantine. We was quarantined long before the quarantine. <laughs> Y'all knew a quarantine. We live very isolated anyway. And, mm -hmm. and we have to be very careful. It's very easy for me to get lost in this world behind. Because okay. nobody's bothering me. I'm being prolific. I'm getting my therapy. Nobody's getting on my nerves. I'm good. Mm -hmm. Until I walk outside and I go, whoa, whoa. what's, what's... Now I got to reacclimate myself to dealing with people. <laughs> Yeah, you hit on something. I think you hit on something because I feel like as an artist, 
you kind of you kind of have to make sure that you're not losing losing connections. And so for me, I'm super big on bringing my friends together. We have what's called like, it's an event called Bottles of Blankets. And it really is just the way of just like fellowshipping because- Say it again, what's, what's it called? What's it called? It's called Bottles and Blankets. Bottles and Blankets, all right. Yeah, it's a way of fellowshipping. It's a way of like decompressing because if you don't, it it's a dangerous spiral. That is something okay. that I've recognized well, and talking well, I, to other artists. Mm -hmm. But to finish my statement and to go with what Ashley's saying, one thing that people don't talk about that I'm now beginning to talk about is that artists and musicians are more susceptible to depression. Mm -hmm. And we don't even know it, which mm -hmm. also plays into your creative cycle. It can mm -hmm. also play into a block. It might not be a block. It might be mild depression. See, we're yeah. stimulated, we feel the world different. So you have to really understand where those pieces of the puzzle fit because your whole job in your career is to maintain some level of creative balance. It's easy to be off the charts. If I'm in here, look, being in this room, and I'm sure Ashley will agree with me, it's like time travel. I can come in here at nine o'clock in the morning and punch in and get on a canvas and look back up and it might be nine o'clock the next day. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows where I've been and I ain't tired. I ain't tired of traveling. And I might not want to come back just yet. <laughs> but imagine that now. Now we're talking about relationships. Because if the partner you have don't understand that commitment at that time or how that stuff works, then trying to find a mate is even difficult. Yeah. You know, so we can't just talk about art and collectors and this stuff without talking about the meat of the issue. Where does it come from? How does it manifest? How do you control it? What are you seeking? Are you seeking yeah. um, um, progress in your in your work? Are you mm -hmm. seeking balance within your spiritual self? Mm -hmm. But someone said, Pancho is the sermon, the scripture, and the collection plate. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, man. <laughs> Both of you are amazing. Let me get this one question, and Shanice confirmed for me that Oprah is watching. So thank you, Oprah, for watching today. This is the... Um, so this is our 45th show. Um, anytime you want us to come on, we're happy to do. What what would you say to um, Blair, uh, Poncho, Ashley, what would you say to Oprah and others like her? How can they be supportive of businesses like yours? Also talk to some of us who are in organization institutions. Tell us, how can we be supportive? Ashley, I'll start with you and then Poncho. I would say uh, one, sharing sharing allow us you know afford us the platform to tell our stories to share our stories uh, you can also visit www.creativelynomadic.com uh, right. that is a thing uh, but honestly it's not always about the money sometimes it, it really is about just making sure that we're sharing and whether that be we're connecting with others or we're partnering in some type of um, project Really, I, I think that's how we share, making sure that we're not muted and making sure that we remain authentic. And again, to me, authenticity means that showing us in every uh, every real and genuine uh, facet that we are as Black people. Mm -hmm. well, I'm, I'm going to say something that's not going to sound too attractive. Uh -oh. Don't get it. This is the first time she's watching and you're going. All right. No, no. I'm being okay. real. Oprah's just okay. another person. Okay, okay, got it, got it. Gotta be real got first. It. Got it. It's not Oprah's responsibility to do anything for us. The problem with artists is we're too beggy and needy. We always right. want you somebody to no, help I, us. That's a good, I mean, I, I appreciate We always it. want somebody to help us. Please help me. I'm suffering. I'm just going through this process alone. Please kind of help me. Give me a space. Give me a venue. Give me a customer. Get over it. Those people are already out there waiting for you. Oprah has been to several shows that I've participated in. Thank you for taking the time to stop and look. She got more art than all of us. She knows talent. All I need Oprah to do is mention my name to another person. That's all, all I right, need. So you need. That's yeah, all I need. But we, have to be, yeah. but we have to be real about where we stand. We have more at our access right now. I did better business during the quarantine from the pandemic last year than I've done the last decade. Mm. When they called the pandemic, I went straight to U-Haul. I bought a bunch of boxes, some tape, 
and some stretch wrap because I believed that was going to be the beginning of another iteration of my business and I was going to have a struggle. Surprise to me, because of broadcasting on Facebook, I found another connection to my following and we made more money during the pandemic than I made the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Opportunities are vast. We can't keep depending on one person or, or the grant system or the, the, the government system that's helping artists right now, or these art initiatives that come that help very few artists, okay? What we also need to understand is artists are not special. Stop it. I used to think that artists were one out of 20 people. No. Every two people, one might be an artist. That was my biggest awakening the last two decades. So you got all these needy people wanting to do things and they don't have the answers and they're trying to figure it out in their own head and they're looking to the left and they see all the success over here and can't figure it out. They're looking at guys like me. I don't even know what he's doing. He must have a, a stunt double. They're looking over here and these people are doing un, treating it like an underground. Like I don't need to make any money to do what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to keep it to the essence of what I, I, I Mass confusion. What yeah. I will say is that if you look at your work as a commodity, and you figure out who your demographic is, you will never starve in your life. Charles Bibbs, good friend of mine, once said to me, I was probably about 20 years old. He says, Pancho, I survive off of 150 customers a year. And if I have 150 customers a year, I make seven figures. Hmm. Resonated with me. But remember that number I gave you now. I told you I'm in 500,000 homes. You can't do that with a 10 edition. You can't do that with just original work. You have to come up with a method that allows you to reach that amount of people. And so my specialty area has been publishing and learning how to publish and self-publish my own work, along with working with other publishers mm -hmm. to get my images in as many people's hands as I can. That's been my approach. Am I trying to seek fame? No. But I tell you what, People ask me all the time, Poncho, are you in so-and-so museum? I'd rather be in 500,000 homes than one museum. There's so many opportunities available to us as creatives. Right now, if you are not succeeding as an artist because you don't want to, printing stuff is inexpensive, the equipment is inexpensive, cameras are inexpensive, video cameras are inexpensive, and then why y'all whining about how expensive the art supplies are? I got our supplies sometimes that last me for two, three years. We got to get our minds right. The grant system, a trillion artists are trying to get these grants and you're upset when you get one rejection letter. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a fire in 1995 where I lost my studio and everybody asked me, Quancho, what do you miss the most from that fire? I had a binder, a three inch binder of rejection letters of all the things people told me no because I knew I was getting closer to somebody saying, yeah. And guess what was in that list? A form letter from Oprah Winfrey, recognizing that she received something from me, okay? We have to center ourselves and realize that God gave us this ability to do what we wanna do with it. And once you understand that power, I tell people as a child, I always wish I was a superhero. And then I realized it was art. That's my secret Beautiful, power. beautiful, beautiful. That's my secret power. Yeah, no, beautiful. Let me just tell you, this hour has gone by so fast. Ashley, you and Poncho are amazing. I was going on, I was looking down because I'm going on to try to figure out how I can buy one of your pieces as well, Ashley. I know others were doing the same. Let me just say thank you to both of you. We have put in the chat, we have put in on Facebook the ways to find them. Um, let me give them to you. You can find Poncho, LarryPonchoBrown.net. He's on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, Larry Poncho Brown, Larry Poncho Brown, in the art of Poncho. You will be able to find him. Ashley, CreativelyNomadic.com, Facebook and Instagram, Creatively Nomadic. We want to thank you both so, so, so very much for an amazing entrepreneurship matters. Let me give a couple of... Um, announcements and then we'll be um we'll be a wrap so next thursday we will be coming back with two other entrepreneurs this is all about beauty we have quentin lathan of beauty plus and kimberly smith of the brown booty co-op two amazing beauty beauty store entrepreneurs you do not want to miss 
Please follow us, JH Connects, on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Email us feedback, jhconnects at jhu.edu. I want to thank all of our partners, Johns Hopkins University, Johns Hopkins Health System, Hopkins Local, the Mayor's Office of Minorities, Small Minority and Women-Owned Business, the Warnock Foundation, Goldman Sachs 10KSB, and Bloomberg Philanthropies. Thank you, Poncho. Thank you, Ashley. So Thank you much. so much. <laughs>